Good evening. <clears throat> wow, what a cool group tonight. Man, great crowd for a nice evening uh, tonight to come in and have a little tunnel vision, right? <laughs> I know, that was bad. <laughs> just had to throw one thing in like that. Anyway, I'm Shauna Robinson from the Herod Forum, and it certainly is my pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's program on what I think is a very intriguing title, The 51 Tunnels That Save Twin Falls. <coughs> and what's even more intriguing is the subtitle, which goes on to say, The Twin Falls Canal Company's Bold Solution to a Nasty Drainage Surprise. And with that, I think it's something that any screenplay writer could not resist, and we will see Harrison Ford starring in <laughs> Anyway, we're in for a great program tonight. I, I can't wait for Brian and Jim to get started with this. Uh, but first, I need to uh, take care of a few things for some reminders, announcements, and just a few acknowledgments. First, if you're new to the Herald Forum, uh, or haven't signed up for our email reminders ever, uh, please do so. Over on the information table as you walk in, it's a little form that looks like this. So if um, you would like, please uh, submit the information to uh, CSI, the Harris Center, and we can put you on our, our list to send uh, announcements each month when we have our speakers come in. So we'd love to have you on that list. And uh, also, our schedule of speakers is over there, but at this point, we're almost to the end of our season, speaker season. We have one more month left before our summer break. And if some of you notice on the table, the announcement for next month's uh, speaker, uh, Building the Iron Road, the Archaeology of Chinese Workers Along the Central Pacific Railroad in Utah. And archaeologist Ken Cannon from Utah will be up um, to give this presentation. And uh, he's done quite a bit of research with this and has written some wonderful things about his research. And in fact, uh, not too long ago, there was, one of, uh, there was an article in Smithsonian Magazine that featured uh, his research from this particular project. So that gives you an idea of the quality of the work that he does. And you probably will get used to maybe seeing Ken Cannon around the neighborhood because he'll be back to Twin Falls in September as he's working, doing a project for the Twin Falls County Historic Preservation Commission uh, in uh, setting up a historic mining district in the Snake River Canyon. And what we're doing <laughs> with the help of, uh, excuse me, with the help of our leader, Ron James, from the, our chair here at the Herrick Forum and also on the Preservation Commission, uh, is uh, setting up uh, or surveying sites for placer mines, uh, placer mining sites rather, in the Snake River Canyon that were set up by the Chinese and also later on by uh, those in the Depression era. So it was uh, pretty busy down in that canyon at different times. So uh, again, Ken Cannon, next month, and I think you'd really enjoy this program. So mark it on your calendar. I should mention too that uh, you know it is our last next month is our last uh, speaker for this season. But in the meantime, we're busy setting up for next season, which will start in September. And uh, we're in for uh, some really cool presentations, I think. And uh, the lineup is going to take us all the way from base jumpers in September to Buffalo Soldiers in May. And in between, uh, I won't tell you yet, but it's, it's that we have some really cool things we're waiting to confirm. <clears throat> so uh, stay tuned. Um, one thing you can do, though, is later this summer, check the Harris Center website. They should have a full schedule listed. Um, and certainly, uh, in expressing gratitude, it's so nice to have a use of the facility here at the Parrot Center and to get support from the CSI Foundation 
and also the Earl and Hazel Faulkner Foundation. Uh, without them, we certainly couldn't provide these program programs to the community. And uh, we also are so appreciative of audiences that come to support what we do. And uh, it makes it fun and it makes it interesting when we can present these sometimes unknown things and lots of times very interesting things to those here in our community. And now with all of that, uh, let me get to our introductions. And I was thinking, you know, gosh, Brian and, and Jim, Dr. Jim Gentry are so well known. How do you do an introduction it's for those that don't need an introduction, really? <laughs> uh, but they, uh, Brian and Jim have been working for a long time, uh, at least a year. How long, Brian? Maybe Jim? Two years? Maybe? Two years, Jim. Yeah. February 10th. 2021. <laughs> <laughs> My first email. Uh, what time was that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, anyway, they've been working a long time. And uh, there's Dr. Gentry, retired history <coughs> professor from uh, here at CSI. And uh, Brian Olmsted, a retired general manager of the Twin Falls Canal Company. And so I think it's great that they paired up and pooled all their knowledge and writing skills to put together this program, and for this book rather, on a part of Twin Falls' history that is, I think, very fascinating. And with the, the book, uh, the 51 tunnels that say Twin Falls, it's soon to be released to the public, so watch for it. I bet you'll have it in your library, certainly. Uh, lots of historic photos, I understand, and lots of good information will be part of it. And uh, it's certainly an amazing story. And yesterday, Ryan took uh, members of the Preservation Commission into one of the tunnels, and I can see that uh, after experiencing that walk of, what, 1,800 feet, wasn't it, Ryan, uh, underground, um, I had to imagine to myself, how in the world did they ever figure this out? And how in the world did they ever manage to design and, and create these things? But it's an amazing story, certainly, of engineering, danger, and bravery on the part of the planners, all those involved, and certainly the workers. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gentry and Brian Homestead. I uh, appreciate your interest in our project that Brian and I have been working upon. And uh, I must say that uh, we have had a chance to get to know each other uh, rather well. And uh, I, b before I get into sharing some analysis of the tunnels, I did just want to mention uh, people who've been uh, particularly helpful in terms of uh, information, for example, the Twin Falls Canal Company has shared uh, meeting minutes from the directors and the shareholders and various other things, all of which became very important in doing the researching and uh, writing. Uh, also, as we've gone through the different uh, uh, sources, uh, there's over 460 uh, drainage contracts, for instance. Uh, which I'll be making reference to a little bit later on. That's, that's a lot of uh, drainage contracts. Uh, Brian and I initially were on the Twin Falls County Historical Preservation Commission together, and we talked about the tunnels and the context of that. And somewhere uh, in February of 2021, uh, we started to get serious on the process. Um, I also want to mention Paul Smith, uh, who has been uh, so great a friend in all the different local history stuff that I've been involved in. And uh, Paul was uh, involved in helping us make connection with the Boise archives. Uh, and uh, also uh, very recently uh, working with the Caxton printers, uh, for which we now have a, a contract 
in the, in the works. But uh, I, I want to get into uh, doing some analysis, and I forgot to do the one thing I always do when I start, and that is to write down the time I started. Uh, so I think that was somewhere around uh, 7.40, because if I don't do that, we may be here a long time. So. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when the Twin Falls Land and Water Company turned over the uh, system uh, to the uh, newly formed Twin Falls Canal Company in 1909, no one was really anticipating the problem which would emerge. Uh, it was assumed that when the water was going down through uh, the system that it would go through in the same way that the water had been going through uh, in the north side for a long time. And so there was great surprise because once the Twin Falls Canal Company got started in 1909, by 1911, a seepage was beginning to emerge. And in fact, by 1913, there were 500 acres that could not be cultivated uh, due to excess uh, seepage. Uh, the USDA, the uh, Agriculture Department, began to help after being asked for help. Uh, and W. Uh, G. Sloan and others were contacted and they encouraged the company to be able to, to deal with this. In 1914, uh, the canal company hired an engineer by the name of C.F. Brown of Salt Lake City uh, to help the company figure out what they might do to deal with this problem of seepage. And lo and behold, uh, the, um, uh, pro the solution which they came up with in the short run was these uh, drainage contracts, as I mentioned, some 460 of them. That was by the 1970s, so that included the, the latest ones. But one of the things that the drainage contracts did was to uh, provide for uh, uncompensated easements so that the canal company could uh, work with drainage and, and do it without having to pay or to buy um, easements from the farmers. Well, what initially emerged uh, was to drill wells, and then also to take that water and put it in pipes to, to send it off. Well, the, the, the wells worked great, but the water didn't want to go flowing out. In fact, uh, it would sit for months. I think Brian may be showing a picture later on where they had water that had sat there for four months and nothing had happened. And so if you wanted the water to go, it had to have a slope. And when you think about that, that gives you some idea of what was going on with the tunnels, because what the tunnels would do was they would provide enough slope that the water would drain away. And of course, that would become very, very important. So the problem really did not have a solution uh, until the 1920s. Uh, there were temp, there were tile was laid and, and uh, various wells were dug. But the reality is the water simply was not moving. Then this was further complicated in the early 1920s by a farm depression uh, where prices went down. What happened was that during uh, World War I, there had been an overproduction, and now the Europeans were producing some of their own wheat, and, and so the prices fell, and that would create a real setback. So finally, uh, in 1924, uh, an experimental technique that was a very important experimental technique, and that was the first 
of the tunnels. And this tunnel was what is now called the fish hatchery tunnel. It was called the owl tunnel. One of the fun things about working in these tunnels is the names that change from time to time. But those of us who've lived in the Twin Falls area for very long are familiar with the fish hatchery tunnel, which is better known as the CSI fish hatchery tunnel, which is now no longer going to be the CSI fish hatchery tunnel. But we won't get into the future. We'll just try to deal with the past. So one of the advantages of the tunnel was that you could drop that uh, entry into the canyon uh, to about 20 to 40 feet and create that tunnel and then the water would come down out of the wells or it could co come up. One of the beautiful things is the wells sometimes dropped, brought the water down. Often the water came up from this newly completed well. And so the reason that the tunnels were possible was because of all these canyons and interlocking um, uh, uh, canyons in the area. For example, of the 51 tunnels that were completed, and by the way, the tunnels were uh, completed uh, by 1951, and there's 51 tunnels finished in 51. That makes it easy to remember, at least. But uh, part of what happened uh, here was that these tunnels could, could empty into uh, various uh, canyons and coolies. For example, just to give you an idea uh, of the uh, 30, 37 of the 51 tunnels, uh, were deposited in three creeks, Rock Creek, Mud Creek, and Deep Creek. Nine were in Cedar Draw, and five were in various coolies. Uh, four were in I coolie, uh, one was in S coolie. So I'm just kind of giving this to give you the feeling of the fact that the tunnels allowed the water to move into the canyons, and that was absolutely crucial. In fact, it's talked about saving Twin Falls. Had the tunnels not been developed, how, who, who would have wanted to buy land that was so waterlogged and seeped that you couldn't even cultivate it? So, I mean, this, this was a very, very important uh, decision. But anyway, so the first and what I want to do here is kind of give you, there's, there's five kind of categories of tunnels, and I want to just share those with you, and then I want to share just one tunnel. This is just one selective tunnel from each of those categories, so we can do it without uh, spending too terribly long. So the first group of tunnels between 1924 and 1927, uh, there were eight of those tunnels, and they had to be contracted uh, out uh, to individuals to drive them. Now, because we were going into rock, this was more like mining than it was uh, traditional agriculture that you would deal with back east, for example. So you're not digging these, you're driving these uh, through the rock. And you, that's where you can see here just beautifully uh, the pictures, uh, and, and this happens to be in the fish hatchery tunnel, but you, it gives you a real sense of the colors and everything uh, that were there. And the, the whole problem of lava rock, or the presence of lava rock, was both a blessing and a curse. Uh, it was a blessing in the sense that the lava rock tunnels would not collapse. They're still there today. It was a curse in the sense that it was extremely expensive to dig these because you had to use dynamite and it was just a very long and, and somewhat dangerous process, um, I might say. And so the, the curse was that it was expensive. They could go sometimes maybe four or five feet a day and, uh, and it was, uh, it would, the, 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 the blessing was that they wouldn't fall in, you know. It, you can imagine if you had clay 
that you were building these tunnels and it would not have worked so well. But anyway, uh, of, the, of the first group of tunnels, the eight tunnels, I've selected the fish hatchery tunnel as an example. Uh, it was expanded. And one of the things that's interesting here, and I'm sure Brian, uh, Brian will be talking about that a little later, is that, for example, in this picture, this is a big tunnel. It had been dug several different times, so they kept expanding it, I'm sure. But anyway, uh, this ex ex uh, extensions continued, and ultimately uh, the, uh, uh, the, the tunnels were, the, the, in, the, in the case of the Fitch Hatchery Tunnel, it was completed by um, 1941. So there were several different types, and, and uh, the uh, information there is, uh, is very good. Then the second group of tunnels uh, between 1928 and 1929, uh, and there were 11 different tunnels during that period. And uh, during this short period, the Clar Tunnel, uh, which is east of the sugar factory, um, was, uh, was being uh, dug. And I uh, can't do much with it here, but in the uh, in the book, we have uh, a, an estimate to tunnel contractor, which is used. And this is on the Clar Tunnel on September 15, 1929. And uh, it gives you great details on what was being used and what was being deducted. And, and as a result of all the things that were being purchased, uh, often the total income was not so great for the contractor uh, as they had hoped, I'm sure. But anyway, the other thing between 1928 and 1929 is they brought in a, a lot of heavy equipment with the idea of uh, cutting down on the cost of tunnel construction by using heavy equipment and that uh, did not work so well. Uh, in fact, uh, so it was on to plan B. Uh, unfortunately, with the building of all these tunnels, uh, there was uh, problems of debts and cost overrides accumulated. And in response to the economic problems, on January the 9th, 1929, the board of directors uh, removed General Manager Burton Smith, that uh, he had been in that position since 1924, and the idea was that <coughs> he had simply spent too much money. So this is going to be a frequent problem which the uh, canal company is going to have of trying to find the balance between getting the job done of, of uh, uh, digging the tunnels and the cost of digging them, and we'll see another uh, general manager will lose his job here uh, pretty soon. So anyway, uh, the next uh, category uh, of tunnels is between 1929 and 1932. And uh, during this time, uh, we see the prominence of John E. Hayes. And Hayes was well known in the area. He had laid out canals. Uh, he had surveyed uh, the Twin Falls uh, town site. Um, and so uh, he was hired as general manager and uh, in many ways functioned very, very well, but had the problem of overexpanding uh, the amount of money that was being spent. It was during Hayes period as general uh, manager that the longest of the tunnels w began to be constructed. And uh, if you've lived in this area for a long time, the Orchelera Tunnel, it is 7,655 feet in length. So it's the longest of the tunnels. It's over a mile, obviously, uh, and is uh, certainly well known. And it would have 
later, time after time, there would be the adding of more length. Uh, just at the time when they thought they were making progress, then there was a need for more length of tunnel uh, to, uh, uh, to get the job done. And I might just say that the, uh, the building of the, uh, <coughs> excuse my grandpa brain here, I'm just a little bit of fuzz, I'm, I'm pulling back in here. But anyway, uh, as I said, uh, Hayes was uh, instrumental in, uh, in uh, developing the uh, tunnels. And in September the 30th of 1930, uh, he wrote an article, uh, Draining a Desert of the Past, in the DuPont Magazine. And it really is a fine article on the beginning of the tunnel construction. In fact, in my book, I've mentioned and the acknowledgments that, from my standpoint, Hayes's work is really kind of the beginning of the fascination with the tunnels and the study of the tunnels later on. Unfortunately for Hayes, just before he, uh, or just after uh, he completed uh, his uh, being selected, was the beginning of the Great Depression. That was not a good time to be getting started uh, for a job. And of course, the cost of the tunnels during the Depression, that became even more of an issue. And so ultimately, uh, Hayes knew that he was not going to be retained. And so he resigned during a special session of the directors on February 22nd, 1932. 1932, by the way, was one of the toughest of the years uh, in the Depression. So in the following uh, group of tunnels, uh, the direct, for the uh, following group of tunnels, the director selected John W. Iron. And uh, Iron had been with the company. He had been with, first with the Twin Falls Land and Water Company in 1906, and then later on, with the uh, Twin Falls Canal Company. So he had been there for a long time. And between 1933 and 1939, uh, he would be instrumental in uh, uh, digging 12 new tunnels. Uh, and one of those was the Harvey Tunnel, uh, which was, although it was medium length in the length of the tunnel, it was well known for developing large amounts of water. And one of the interesting things, and Brian had to really help me a lot to get that straight in my mind, is that the goal wasn't making tunnels as long as possible. In fact, the goal was to have them as short as possible. But the trick was the smallest amount of tunnel with the most amount of water uh, accumulating, uh, miners' inches, and so forth. But anyway, uh, uh, John Iron um, played a key role um, in this uh, period, and uh, he uh, collaborated with the New Deal in uh, constructing tunnels. Uh, the Civil Works Administration uh, played a key role in, uh, in uh, getting uh, tunnels constructed. Uh, also, um, the uh, development of other, uh, um, what I want to say, are closely related uh, issues, such as the CCC camps. Even though they weren't directly impacting, they were still influencing the growth of, of these tunnels a great deal. Ironically, uh, John Iron died on January the 9th, 1939, and that was the day before uh, the annual uh, company meeting. And you can imagine what a tizzy that threw things into. And uh, in uh, reading over, there were lots of uh, testimonials to John. He had been around for a long time and uh, was well known and, uh, and was appreciated. 
The last group of uh, tunnels um, were uh, dug between 1940 and 1951. I'm violating my own policy, or better to say driven than dug. Dug kind of gives you that feeling of a mattock and, and uh, soil, and that wasn't what was here. But between 1940 and 1951, the nature of tunnels began to change. For one thing, the water table dropped. And as a result of that dropping water table, there was less threat to uh, the uh, problem of seepage. Uh, in fact, of the 11 tunnels, when you look at it, there was 11 tunnels that were driven between 1940 and 51. But of those 11 tunnels, uh, um, most of them, in fact, 10 out of the 11 tunnels were 665 feet or shorter. So they were, they were short tunnels. There was only one, the Galloway Tunnel, that exceeded 1,000 feet. So by the time the last tunnel, which was the Nye Tunnel, uh, by the time the last tunnel was driven, uh, there would be uh, a, a change in the situation because of the water level. But another problem, and, and I want to say uh, that as more and more uh, settlers were beginning to get their own water supply uh, through wells and so forth, then less irrigation water was being dumped in which then created less uh, accumulation. But anyway, when these tunnels were all completed with the last one in, in uh, 1951, and there was a little bit over 11 miles of tunnels, so like it's 11.3. Um, and so obviously that means there's a lot of holes around here. And uh, interestingly, the uh, tunnels uh, are not seen very much, you know, because they were so effective. The very fact that you can't see them means that they were so effective they got the job done without having water running all over the place. Just a couple other uh, observations here, and then uh, Brian is going to share some PowerPoint with us. But one of the problems that caused uh, a decline in the use of tunnels, in addition to the uh, lower um, uh, uh, water table, is that inflation, the World War II inflation caused uh, uh, a tremendous increase in cost. Uh, also, new equipment uh, made it possible uh, to uh, accumulate some of the goals of tunnels without having to dig full-size tunnels. And so, and I know Brian will, <coughs> will share with us uh, quite a bit on this, but one of the things that the tunnels did, which are often not really thought about too much, is that they helped to uh, give a permanent water stream, stream year-round stream. When, when we think about irrigation, you know, in the fall when the water's turned off, the water supply is gone. And so what the tunnels did was to provide a year-round uh, source of water which in turn uh, provided habitat for plants, fish, uh, other animals, and that's very important. If we try to envision what this area would be like without the tunnels, it would be a very different place, that's for sure. So, Okay, well, Brian, I'm going to give you a microphone here. Welcome, everybody. Um, just a quick question. Um, how many of you out there have, been, have crawled into or walked into one of the tunnels? Quite a few, and, and usually it was young boys who would, um, you know, see the tunnels. That the old timers, um, you know, if you're, it was being built on your father's farm. I talked to some people that are, are now deceased, but they 
as kids on Sundays, the canal company crews or the contractors didn't work, so they would, the kids would all go down and, and they would push each other in and out of the tunnel in the ore carts. But um, uh, this all tunnel, the fish hatchery tunnel, was the very first one, and Jim said it was a large tunnel, but in reality, you can see me there, that's about um, you know, three and a half feet wide and, and five and a half feet tall. Well, as they got better at, and in other places in that all tunnel, it was you know, 10 feet wide and, and 15 feet high in places. They didn't know that this was a guinea pig tunnel. There was nobody had, had ever done drainage tunnels like this for irrigation. So they, and they didn't have the miners hired yet. It was just canal company crews that went out there. And so they just loaded a bunch of dynamite in and, and blew the heck out of it. And, and um, what they found out before very long was every ton that you blast out of there, you've got to haul out you know, two men pushing an ore cart. So, so they got very good after they got a few hundred feet into that tunnel. But that, um, all that uh, rock on the, on the bottom there, that was an area that they not only blew way too big, probably a you know, 10 or 12 foot ceiling, but they also, they wanted to get air into the tunnels for the, for the miners working in there. They, they had the air compressors that had a, had a, a kerosene um, uh, generator out, outside of the tunnel that would, would provide the air for them to run the, the drills. But they, um, they also wanted to drill wells down from the top to um, clear the air out after the blasting. So. So in, in the later tunnels, they drilled all those wells first, and then you blasted to hit the wells. And so they made a nice straight tunnel and exactly, usually five feet, five feet wide and, and six feet tall was kind of the, because the canal company paid by, by, the, by the linear foot that you blasted. But, but in this one, um, and I think, and a lot of this rock obviously fell after the rails were taken out. At some point, they, a lot of times they went back in in the, probably 40s and 50s and salvaged rails and reused them in other tunnels or, or just used them for scrap in World War II. But um, uh, so I suspect that probably during the, like the Wells earthquake, that tunnel probably had several rock falls out of that ceiling where, where most of the later tunnels that were very precisely blasted, they have a nice solid ceiling and, and you don't see any of that rock on the bottom. So it's kind of a fun tunnel to go in just because uh, I hadn't seen it until just a a couple months ago, Jim and I went in, but I better get going. But yeah, it was great at high adventure for, for boys to go into those tunnels, because back then, when I was a kid, the first one I went into was the, under the municipal golf course, there's one that comes out under, under uh, fairway number 17, and, and so kids always used to hunt golf balls down there in Rock Creek for slicers, and so, so everybody would go into that tunnel, and uh, you know, we didn't have good flashlights, five boys with one crummy dead battery flashlight, so. It seemed like forever if you went in even a couple hundred feet, and that one goes about um, 3,000 feet, I think, all the way under the golf course. Okay, um, so I, I've got quite a few slides. I'll, I'll go through them pretty fast, and then we'll have a little time for questions. And if I see yawns, I'll go really fast. So. Okay, so I.B. Pryan, of course, um, you know, had the dream to start the Twin Falls Tract. He'd, um, he had settled his ranch down in the Blue Lake Canyon, and there were springs down, you know, the Blue Lake Springs were down there already prior to 1900. They were from that Northside Aquifer, which is the ESPA comes all the way from Ashton to King Hill. So, so those springs were there, but the south side, which this is Mr. Pryan's orchard then a few years later, probably about 1910, he had, um, he had built the bridge that is still there that the city pipeline comes across on. And then he had developed orchards on the south side too. So this is the Blue Lakes Country Club and the big springs that were always there. There were no springs on the south side. This is all sagebrush until that's Brian Cooley going down that he used to um, divert for, for all the orchards on the south side. So very few springs, maybe very limited ones way down at the bottom of the canyon because we just didn't have the aquifer. It was three to 400 feet deep on the south side where the water was you know, within 100 feet of the canyon rim a lot of places on the north side. So, and this was his house on, whoops, Somebody might know which, which fairway that is. You drive across this stretch of Alpheus Creek here now, but that's where Ivy Pryan lived. And, and then um, in addition to the orchards, of course, uh, when the other stream started coming off of the rim, um, he would catch those for placer mining in the wintertime. Ivy Pryan was quite a, quite a miner too. Shauna, do you know what hole that is? Nine. That's number nine, okay. <laughs> anyway, it was a beautiful place. And why he wanted to have uh, 
you know, he had a, a paradise down there, why he wanted to, um, you know, go through all the stuff that he went through for the next 50 years to get a bunch of neighbors up above, I don't know. But, but um, he went upstream, he wanted to have these neighbors and, and he knew you couldn't get the water up out of the 400 foot deep canyon. So, so he found the future site of Milner Dam. And, um, and the reason this was a good place to build the, to start diverting for both the north side and the Twin Falls Canals is the canyon's only about 35 feet deep here. So he had to just raise the water 35 feet, which was still a major feat on a river that size in 1900. But uh, Oregon Trail came right along here about where that X was. And, and the river was in three channels here, at least in high water. So it also made it so you built three small dams instead of one giant dam across the river. And you could you know, build one dam and then divert the water out through the other channels and, and build the second dam. And then they had to do a tunnel right under this um, so this is an island here that the old spillway was on, and this is an island here that the new spillway was on. And then this was Clapine Rock, which was the historic rock that the hunt, the John Jacob Astor, the Wilson Price Hunt Expedition had came to grief in 1811 here at the site of Milner Dam, or some people would say farther down at, at Cauldron Lynn, but in, in reality, it's class five rapids from this point on all the way to, to um, you know, the, the Milner power plant about a mile and a half downstream. So this was where the hunt party came to their demise. And, and so Clapine Rock was named after a French Canadian uh, trapper, one of the canoe men and a pretty experienced canoe guy, apparently um, drowned in the rapid coming right. You can't really see it, but this is where the canyon starts. So that was the first major rapids. And um, he drowned and at least according to history, they dragged him up on that rock and then they walked uh, all the way to uh, Astoria then through that winter of 1811, 1812. So anyway, good site to build a dam. Uh, some of you might have seen my Milner Zoom presentation. There was all kinds of problems with Milner Dam too, but, but we won't go into that too much for now. Cause, oh, and then um, the other thing that, so this was the uh, company house being built and then later a grand hotel was built at Milner. Everybody thought Milner would be a fabulous town, but, but a guy named Henry Shoddy from Burley had built 12 of these big water wheels along the river all the way from there to Burley. And he used them some for irrigating uh, crop ground in the summer and then he used them for placer mining in the winter. So he was a real engineer. These things were massive structures. I mean, in some places he had six water wheels all together, but I gotta get moving. <laughs> but anyway, this was how they blasted the uh, uh, north side canal, particularly the Twin Falls Canal was mostly dirt. And then they used all the blast rock to, um, to build the Milner Dam. I'm just doing a little bit of history to get to how we got to the tunnel. So, um, and this is how Milner Dam was built then, uh, a double row of uh, fir planks through the middle with a little bit of a concrete footing down at the, at the riverbed. And then they just piled rocks on both sides of it. So the, so the lava rocks were the immovable mass and the, the wood in the middle was supposedly the impenetrable barrier, except when they dropped all those huge lava rocks off of that electric derrick, they broke all kinds of holes through the, through the middle of the wood in the dam. So the dam leaked like a sieve from the start, but they eventually sluiced, they sluiced a lot of mud um, all the way from the, you know, the water level out on a three to one slope out here. And that eventually sealed. In fact, from the start, it really sealed it, except the, for the first few years, the water would always find a way through, but it never did move the lava rocks because that's, that's why it was such a stable dam. It could get a sinkhole but you'd just go add dirt on the upper side and you could patch it. Now Teton Dam, what happened when they had a sinkhole? It took the whole dam out in a matter of a couple hours. Milner had had hundreds of sinkholes like that. And everybody said this was primitive technology and you know, the Teton Dam was 1976 and it washed out in about an hour and <laughs> after they filled it. So, so the Bureau uh, didn't learn from the engineer who had built Milner Dam. And they didn't have any OSHA, obviously, or environmental rules. So <laughs> if, you, um, you know, if you gave the crane operator a bottle of whiskey, he would give you a ride, uh, circus ride across. And this is the, the rapid on that north channel, which, which uh, Clapping Rock would be just around the corner there. This was the rapid that drowned the hunt expedition and, and wrecked their canoes, and, and they walked on uh, the rest of the way. Uh, Milner, the town, uh, at, at that time, there was a couple thousand men, and. Uh, and several thousand horses, and, and so it had um, several thousand saloons. Or, well, actually, just I think three saloons, but <laughs> you would have had several choices anyway before you went and crawled into that dirty old tent at night. So, 
Uh, okay, so here's the here's the uh, uh, the main investors in the Twin Falls track because Brian didn't, you know, he was the fundraiser and the and the entrepreneur, but it was Frank Buell and Peter Kimberly and Walter Filer who were the main investors, mainly Frank Buell, he put up most of the money. And then um, the fourth guy was one of the designers of, of Milner Dam, Schuler was his name, he was a dam engineer from California. And so they came to see the siphon, but what I wanted to, because this was the main obstacle once they got the Twin Falls Canal built was to get across Rock Creek Canyon. But look at Rock Creek Canyon before we had an aquifer. It was a sagebrush canyon other than just a little riparian area in the middle. I mean, you drive anywhere on Rock Creek Canyon now and and all that water that we build up in the south side aquifer started coming out of the walls within the first couple of years and started growing all that vegetation, making all the huge uh, habitat and riparian area that we have now in, in Rock Creek. But, but that's the way the, uh, uh, all the canyons look prior to the, the tunnels and the, and the irrigation because there just wasn't any source of, of perennial water, a flood in the spring and then uh, very little later on. They opened the gate, or this was the closed the gates, this was the tunnels that they used to, to run the river through while they built the, the third of the dams across the Snake River. So they, on, uh, and this is actually not 31005, it's 3105, they closed the gates on the tunnel and five days later they, they turned the water into the Twin Falls Canal and, and the first year it made it all the way to Twin Falls, I think they irrigated something over 30,000 acres that first year, 1905, which Many other Act projects, the farmers were still waiting for that water two or three years later until they finally went bankrupt because uh, Frank Buell had enough money to see the project through. Uh, most Act companies didn't have a, a multimillionaire in 1900 to, to build their canal system. So that's why the Twin Falls system was a Cadillac. And he eventually got his money back, but um, he, had to, he was extended way out there to, to finish the Twin Falls Canal. Northside Canal went bankrupt a couple times before they finally succeeded in um, keeping it alive. So anyway, they started pouring a million acre feet per year onto the ground on the south side, and and this is how they irrigated. You know, with the they had a lot of water. The uh, there was already filings on all the water above Blackfoot, but they just weren't good dam builders, so they could never use it all. So the Twin Falls tract had a lot of water the first few years, and they really poured it on. So you can imagine how much of that was going down into the aquifer, and and that's how straight you could drive a corrugate if you were if you were you know telling your horses to go so now you've seen the tractors with the gps they they start anywhere in the field and drive perfectly straight lines and all the guest rows are perfect and the, but it was a different world and but they put a lot of water on and just thinking like jim said that it would just go right down through the you know four or five feet of soil and then down into the lava rock and, and show up down in the canyon which it did show up in the canyons but not as fast as it was being poured on the top this is what they thought would happen. This is Niagara Spring, which, uh, you know, is augmented by Northside Canal, but it was always there too because that, that Eastern Snake Plain Aquifer on the north side of the canyon comes all the way from Island Park and, and um, the Big Wood, the Little Wood, uh, Fish Creek, all those things were feeding that too. So. so a different world on the north side, but after a few years of irrigating. So here you can see the, you know, the vegetation on the canyon wall on the north side was always historically you know, 100 to 200 feet below the canyon rim. Well, the south side, it was all the way to the bottom until we started irrigating. And then that's when the, the big surprise that Jim talked about, the nasty drainage surprise came along. Uh, Durkee's Lake in 1909, I think, because I think the hotel burned down, and I could be wrong, maybe off a year, maybe, I think about 1910 or 11 anyway, the Shoshone Falls Hotel burned down. But Durkee's Lake is right there. It was a dry box canyon in, in 1910. Uh, there was a little bit of water starting to come out of the south side wall here by, we've been irrigating for five years then, and there was water starting to show up. And so John Durkee bought this dry box canyon and planted a few peach trees down there. Uh, that's another picture of it a little closer up. Well, by about 1921, all of a sudden his whole orchard was, there was just water pouring out of the walls everywhere and his um, orchard was becoming a lake. And, you know, some of it was settlement. Uh, they say it was a big lava bubble. I think mainly the water just rose. And so the low parts of the, of the canyon um, became submerged. So, so it's about 50 feet deep. And by um, 
1928, he, he picked his last crop of peaches from a, ro from a rowboat. And, but, he made, but it worked out really good for John Durkee because then he had a beautiful park down there to, um, you know, for picnics and um, all kinds of stuff that he could. So he made more money off of uh, Durkee's Lake after it became a lake than it was as an orchard. But that's all the, the start of the seepage then. It was, you know, up to, a, you know, the canyon wall below those houses is probably 200 feet or maybe not quite that. So the aquifer had come up from more than 300 feet up to where it could now come out into the, into the canyon. Well, so, it, so that was great for John Durkee, but for people in the, and even in, in Twin Falls, all of a sudden by 1913, probably 1912, they, you could just dig a 25 foot well and have all the water you wanted. Prior to that, they had to bring the water up out of Rock Creek for, for people to use in town. So it was a real good deal for the city of Twin Falls until it came all the way to the surface. So, so this is um, uh, A.C. Boone's farm, about where the Lamb Weston potato plant is now. And that was one of the first areas that became submerged. And, and you can see he's just standing in standing water. This is winter time. So this was 1913. So they've been irrigating for seven years and the water table had come up 25 feet per year or more, some places 50. And so, so it, um, instead of just going off into Rock Creek where you would think it would, it started coming back up in the field. Big surprise. So they, so they hired the drainage engineer to, um, I think they, as, as Jim said, they petitioned the State Department of Agriculture and they sent down a, a drainage here by the name of um, C.W. Sloan, I, yeah, W.C. Sloan, W.C. Sloan, I think that's right. It could be W.G. Because uh, I, I actually put this together quite a few years ago and, um, you know, I'm sometimes wrong but never in doubt. That's kind of been my motto. So I think for a long time I, I, I said that he, I think for a long time I said that he had petitioned Governor Bora to get the, the state to do something. Well, there was never a Governor Bora. It was Governor Stuenberg, I think it was in 1913. Jim, do you? Russ probably knows. <laughs> so I try to be more accurate now. I was just a canal employee then. But anyway, he, here's, here was the quote from him. Uh, uh, the, the wet area on the Boone Tract increased by 160 acres from December to February, from December 13 to February 1914. Every case, the soil becomes so saturated water, it is the consistency of quicksand. I could not walk over it without sinking to the top of my rubber boots. And then Mr. Sloan also predicted that if this is happening here, it's going to happen everywhere. Because for some reason, you're putting on a million acre feet of water and only half a million acre feet of it is draining out below. So, so it's just going to keep moving up slope until you've got a lot of ground flooded. So as Jim said, they started, uh, deliver, they started signing the drainage contracts and it was a cooperative contract where, where the the company would, um, would um, drain the ground. They'd measure how many acres were saturated and drain, and then the, they would charge the farmer so many dollars per acre that, that was salvaged to, um, to pay them back. So it was kind of a half and half type of a deal. But they, they felt like all the stockholders should share in the cost, even though it was only the ones down in the low areas at this point that were being flooded. But everybody was putting that water in, and so and if, if anybody's farm is worth nothing, then you know, it devalues all the other farms too. So, so everybody had to participate in it. They tried doing, now in, in the Burley Irrigation District, for instance, Minidoka, those are alluvial uh, uh, soils in those grounds. So just digging a deep trench next to the fields and the water would drain through the gravel and out. Well, in our silty soils here in Twin Falls, it not only wouldn't drain sideways, so they would dig these trenches with the drainage crews and you'd have water standing 50 feet away. Uh-oh, what did I do? Help. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the trenching did not work in this tract. And, and the reason was that the water was coming up out of the lava rock underneath the soils. So it didn't matter how much you drained on the surface, it, there was always more coming back up. And so you had to... You couldn't get the water far enough down to, to not destroy the crops. Thank you. So the trenching crews didn't work. They had all these drainage tiles to install and they started installing those and they didn't work either. Kind of like Jim said, you can see um, here's, uh, here's water just standing in the fields back here and just a little bit coming out of that drainage trench that went all the way back there. It just it was just more water coming up all the time and all you were draining was a small area 
a few feet either side of that trench. So, so people were really getting alarmed. So they, uh, they decided, well, for some reason, there's artesian pressure. There's water coming up out of the lava rocks. So they, so they by about 19, well, this is 1918, but by 1915, I think, they started experimenting with drilling wells about 60 feet, so down into the lava rock, and the water just came gushing out in geysers. Well, that's just what it was doing in the fields, but it was just a little bit coming out all over the place. So you could get it to come out of a well, and then you could dig a ditch and, and get rid of it, but you still had you know, a farmer with a big ditch going through the middle of his place. So, so they did a combination. They did the trenches first, and then they drilled wells beside them, and then they, they elbowed the wells over with clay tiles over into the trench and then laid the tiles out. And so you could drain a pretty good area uh, with this method. And I think that's Jim right there. And, <laughs> and, and <laughs> anyway, anyway that, that system worked, but you could only drain about 40 acres with a, you know, with a lot of wells. I mean, they had to have wells every 100 feet, say. And um, you know, that was not modern well drilling equipment. It took a long time to drill those wells, but it did work. You could drain areas. You just couldn't drain a very big area. And so here's kind of the concept with the drainage wells. So if you can picture this, this is the low line canal up here, say, and this is the layers of soil going down to, let's pretend that's Rock Creek Canyon. So, so you got the soil on the top, then you've got a lava flow and then you've got in between the, I mean, you've looked at the Snake River Canyon, in between the lava flows is those clay and organic layers. That's where most of the water, I mean, the water moves through all the lava, but it moves real slowly. Well, it moved pretty rapidly through these areas down below, but for some reason they were pinched off when you got near to the canyon rim. And so instead of going on out, the water then was forced up because this canal is a lot higher than this soil here. And I don't know why that mouse is following me around now, but anyway, <laughs> that's the concept of the drainage wells. And kind of the same thing with the tunnels. Eventually, they would drill the tunnels in so that it would intercept these, these layers in between the, the lava flows. And then with the wells being drilled, too, down through, then you could drain. The, the farther down you could get that water to drain, the larger the area that you could drain because it would all move to the what you'd call a cone of depression in um, hydrologic talk. Uh, so then they, you know, they also were improving the drainage systems with, with using dynamite and blasting, and then they, they started buying uh, drag lines and, and trench hose in the later 19-teens. And so the deeper trench you could dig and then drill wells beside it, the more, the more ground you could drain, the same concept. The lower you could get the water in the surrounding ground, the, the more area you could drain with whatever system you were using. It still took a lot of, they did hundreds and probably thousands of miles of these uh, drain, drainage lines and, and every one of them had wells drilled every 50 or 100 feet. So it was, it was breaking the country, the, the company, um, half of the annual budget for the Twin Falls Canal from about 1915 all the way to 1940 was for drainage. So, you know, most irrigation tracks you were paying for your water. Well, here you were paying for your water and then paying to get rid of all the excess water. So it was, it was really breaking the company. And, and um, so this is just blasting to get the trench deeper so they can, uh, so the wells will be more effective in lowering, lowering the water table. And, you know, they, they don't blast like this anymore. Back in those days, I think the blasters liked to see how high they could make the rocks go. <laughs> And of course, uh, you know, it was really hard to move a drag line because to get that drag line through that swamp, they had to have people laying timbers ahead of it and then pulling them out from behind and laying them ahead. So, so they didn't move the drag line to blast. If a rock went through the roof of the drag line, that was okay. And all the, neighbor, all the neighboring farmers were, hated the canal company because they might be blasting like this for two years. And meanwhile, the chickens wouldn't lay eggs and the cows wouldn't, uh, <laughs> wouldn't milk and there'd be a rock come through your kitchen but anyway, the, a nice deep trench then with a well in it, and you can see you've drained the water down probably 10 feet below the surface of the ground there, and you need about five feet. You can't have water any closer than about five feet or you can't grow a crop. It, it uh, creates too much salt and that kind of stuff. So, so the, this was probably where they started getting the idea that, well, you know, if we can dig a deep trench with blasting, then how much better would it be if we had a tunnel that was 20 feet deeper than that even? It would drain a lot larger. That was the concept. Nobody had ever proven it. 
Well, so they went down to where the fish hatchery tunnel is now, and, and um, Al Peters, who I don't remember if Jim talked about him, but uh, Jim has a lot of stuff in the book about more of the, you know, more about the managers, more about the city of Twin Falls, how it grew with the canal company and all the different, uh, you know, depression area and automobiles, but all that, uh, you'll have to read the book. But anyway, they, um, they realized that, hey, if we'd blast a big hole in Rock Creek Canyon, maybe some of that water that's just sitting on the top will drain down through. So, so uh, Al Peters and a couple other guys went down and they drilled 10 feet back into the canyon wall and stuffed all kinds of dynamite in there and, and blew it off. And they say it shook the whole town and the, and the dust lasted for, for hours, I think, before it cleared. But, but they walked back down there and there was 75 inches of water coming out. So they decided, hey, this tunneling idea will work. And they started tunneling right there. And the tunnel, in fact, did work so well that the fish and game decided, well, we'll build a fish hatchery there because all the fish had been killed in Rock Creek, or a lot of them, by all the mud that the farmers were washing in. So, so we'll raise a bunch of trout here and, and try to restock Rock Creek. So they hauled the first trout in by um, milk jugs. And, and this is the amount of water that was coming out of that uh, fish hatchery tunnel, the, the first one. And that was after they'd blasted it in probably uh, you know, maybe a thousand feet or so, not not as far as it is now, but but they um, so they were blasting the tunnel, and originally then drilling holes down through the top of it and and having all that collapsing. Well, they figured out that we need to drill the wells first and then blast the tunnel accurately so we hit it. So if you go in that fish hatchery tunnel, it's just a mess for the first six or seven hundred feet, and then all of a sudden it's a nice square tunnel that's exactly the size that that you could. Um, you know, wheel a cart in and out of and at the right slope, but, but it didn't have all those cave-ins coming from the roof and all that. So that's what it looked like when they finished it in 1926 and, and had the uh, fish and game started running it. Then uh, later on, fish and game, so at that time, uh, Oregon Trail School would sit right about here and the tunnel went back like this and then uh, fish and game was having so much success with it, they decided, hey, if we can blast that tunnel farther, we can get some more water. So the canal company was no longer interested because the fields above had been drained. And by the way, the South Park Tunnel then came in, you know, from this angle over here. But, but so Fish and Game paid to extend that tunnel by another um, five or 600 feet. And, and so when you go in that tunnel, that last stretch that was done in the 1940s, maybe Jim, or late 30s, 41, 41 it's a real nice um, six feet tall, five feet wide. And, and all the wells just have the water coming down or up out of the bottom, the, you know, more the modern type of tunnel. That's what it looks like uh, a few years ago, and you go into the tunnel right behind, the tunnel comes right out uh, the wall about there, and then they um, have some pipes that feed it to all the different hatcheries. Now, the problem with that tunnel is that, and with all the tunnels really, it flows a lot less water than it used to. This one in particular, it's very urbanized up above it now with uh, Oregon Trail and all the South Park developments. Uh, so they're all using city water, but, but there's no irrigation happening. And, and the leakage wasn't just from the canals and ditches, it was every single field leaking down through too. So, so there's probably half the water that there used to be. Most of the tunnels probably run about two thirds of what they did historically. So, so they, but they all do still work as, as Jim said. Uh, this was one of them that, um, he mentioned John Hayes. Well, he put an article in DuPont Magazine. And so this is the Tolbert Tunnel, which is about, a, I think, a little over a mile long. Uh, maybe, only, maybe only three quarters of a mile, but, but it comes out. Um, if any of you know where, where Desert Station was on Rock Creek, where they used to haul the, the horses would bring the water up for the uh, Oregon Trail and the, the stage routes later on. And um, so that tunnel is right below, they actually probably put it down there because there was a good grade going down into the canyon there. So the Tolbert Tunnel was built by John, that was one of them that um, John Hayes was quite proud of. And, and he got paid uh, by DuPont Magazine to, to um, put this in there because he also bought a lot of dynamite from him. DuPont was the main manufacturer of dynamite at the time. So, and this is where the, what the Tolbert Tunnel looked like when they were building it. So, so they'd usually put the tunnel up and same with fish hatchery even about uh, 15 or 20 feet up the tunnel wall because you had to get rid of all that rock that you were, you know, you're wheeling it out by hand. You don't have, to, you know, you can't then dump it and then pick it and throw it all out of the way. So they would build a, a long, um, God, 
What did I do? Anyway, they would, by having the tunnel up a little ways, that it was still at the level that they wanted to be, but it made it a lot easier for the miners to dump the rock. Now, I wanted to show you a couple other things on this picture. Okay. Um, okay, so, so Desert Station then would be, this was that grade coming down that had been there ever since the uh, Oregon Trail days. And, um, and so this then is where, where the sign is for Desert Station now. I it was a Dr. Greffinson, I think, that had this house out there with all the poplars. But guess what? This is how open the countryside was. And again, here by 1930, there wasn't a lot of riparian area in Rock Creek, but it was coming out of all those walls. That is what, what you call now Artema Butte. So that's on the Jerome side of the canyon, about um, you know, two or three miles from the canyon rim, that butte right there. So, so the, you know, the countryside was still really open. I mean, all you had was the farms with a few poplar trees. This would have been about 1929 when, when John Hayes did it. Okay, this is the concept on the tunnel, kind of like the one I, I showed you with the, with the tile drains. So you, uh, you got a tunnel going in on a 1% slope, and, um, and that's so that two miners can push an empty cart in, and two miners can push a, I shouldn't say miners, they were the muckers and the trammers, and I don't know if one, one was a mucker and one was a trammer, or, or they both alternated, but um, anyway, hard job. But they would drill all the wells ahead of time, and so all these wells would be drilled to the level of the tunnel and then a ways below. And they would drill them in a very straight line and usually every 100 feet. So then when um, L.H. Prine would set up a transit and they would blast very carefully to try to get a exactly five by six foot tunnel in there and, and nice and square and nice and stable because you didn't have all that fractured rock from over blasting. So. And then the water would come. Oh, God. Oh, anyway. So the water would come down these wells from above. These are, you know, the well driller would keep a record of where he hit lots of water. And then more water would come up out of the bottom. Now, I don't know if that's true anymore. Most of them I've seen, there's, there's more coming from the top. But that's the concept. This was a tunnel that was worked on later. I don't have any pictures of miners pushing a cart up out of a tunnel. Obviously, they were extending a tunnel here, and they didn't want to have to go through all that water all the way. So they blasted a, another shaft down, and they could pull the carts out with the uh, and then Jim talked about the, the estimate to the tunnel contractor. So this was a guy named Charles Stevens that did this um, from station 753 to, to um, or no, from 11 plus 12 to 12 plus 03. So he blasted about 100 feet in this, in this uh, month long period. And the price was $7.50 a linear foot. So that would have been $678 for him to for his profit and for his, he had a, somebody running the compressor and, and um, two people doing the drilling and the, and the blasting and stuff. Well, then the canal company would subtract from him six boxes of powder, uh, 3,000 feet of fuse, two, two um, uh, box, six boxes of caps, two cans of carbide. They all had the carbide lantern. So by the time they deducted all that, um, $304, the, the contractor got paid uh, Ninety-three dollars for that month of work. So, but they, you know, this was the depression. So, you could get all the people you wanted to do that job for for ninety-three dollars a month. Uh, this is what a, a tunnel would look like afterwards, and they did want to measure how much water they got. And this happens to be the one that comes out under the Twin Falls Golf Course. And one of the fatalities was this was a, a foreman right here. His name was Jack Sorensen. And on the Ochilara Tunnel, a couple of years after this Thorpe Tunnel that goes under the golf course, um, he was killed in a blasting accident. He, he had a cap that blew up on his lap, and, and that's just a small explosion, but there was no antibiotics in the 1930s, so, so it perforated his bowel, and he, and he got infected and died a couple weeks later. So uh, there was only a couple of the miners that died from cave-ins. Mostly it was blasting accidents, either with caps or... Uh, you know, a blast didn't go off, so somebody goes in to see what's wrong. And, um, and then, of course, it goes off. And the fuse, they just had to try to select the amount of fuse that would give them time to get out of the tunnel so they didn't get caught in that blast. Okay, so where are they today, and, and do they still work? And we will have a section at the end of the book that will have a, uh, you know, most of the uh, will be historic pictures of uh, 
some of the stuff I've talked about and other stuff that Jim's worked on, but, but we'll have a section with uh, probably eight pages of uh, more modern uh, color photographs in near the end, so you, so you can see they, they all still do work. Uh, this is the um, entrance to that fish hatchery tunnel. So now that uh, when CSI raised the fish there, you could never go in the tunnel because you stir up mud and stuff from the, from the uh, bottom of the tunnel. So, so now that they're not raising any fish, they, you know, with some coaxing uh, and a good contact like Jim, uh, you can go into the tunnel. So I've done a couple of tours in that one and, and um, pretty fun. So it has a pretty nice ladder up to it too. A lot of them you've got to climb up through stinging nettle and loose rocks to, to get to the mouth. Whoops. <laughs> well, I don't know why that one got turned, but anyway, this is um, uh, Jim and Chantel that, that went in with us. She got the key to let us in. But that's one of the drainage wells pouring out of the top of the tunnel. And this was just a couple months ago, and then we were in yesterday with Shauna and the Historic Preservation, and there's maybe 10% of that amount of water coming out. So, so all summer the farmers are irrigating and the aquifer is building up, and then all winter the tunnel's draining that aquifer back down. So, so March is the lowest time, and it was always a really tough time for the fish hatchery because you, when you got less water, you got a lot less o oxygen, and, and so they had to raise a lot less fish in the springtime than they did in the fall. So. So just the opposite of what irrigation would be, the, the highest time of uh, uh, snowpack melt and everything is in the spring, but the highest time of the tunnel returns is fall. So that worked good for the canal company because other than the 15 tunnels in Rock Creek, all the other tunnel water can pretty much be captured. Uh, uh, KTFI Creek, Deep Creek, Cedar Draw, Mud Creek, you can capture those all and, and reuse them down in the Buell to Lucerne area. So. So it became quite a bonus for the canal company when they could blast tunnels in places where they could recapture the water. Um, this was the preservation group. So I mentioned that all tunnel is all different sizes. Well here, you know, it's a good 10 feet wide and, um, and uh, you know, probably seven feet tall there. And, you know, they just, they just didn't know how to, how to blast a nice straight clean tunnel. And, and by the way, most of the miners they hired after the, most of the tunnel, crews they hired after the first year or two were actual, actual miners that had come from Jarbridge or out of Montana or wherever. And then later on, in the, as it got into the Depression more, the canal company wanted to do it with their own crews again mostly because they were trying to save money. It was really penny pinching by the, by the 30s. Uh, so, so I showed you the one picture of a lot of water discharging out of the one of the wells. Now the other thing the aquifer has is there's just uh, natural cracks and usually you'll see a, a bit of a clay layer where there were quite a bit of water will be coming out and that's uh, where the tunnel intercepted one of those relatively flat uh, clay layers then um, there, there would be water come out just in just out of a seam like this was. Okay so the Clark Tunnel was quite a few years later it's a real nice one to go into it's had a change of ownership so I haven't had the I've done uh, dozens of tours into this one but but look how nice that tunnel is. It's five feet wide and about seven feet tall and straight as an arrow. You can go a half mile into that one and, and you can see right out to the end of the tunnel where that uh, fish hatchery tunnel, it meanders all over the place. They didn't know where they were going, I think, most of the time. <laughs> and that's looking out from the Clark Tunnel. Uh, this is one of the wells with water coming up out of the bottom of the tunnel and, and the water generally in the tunnels coming up um, particularly if it's coming from the bottom, has a lot of minerals in it. You'll see it looks like when you replace your water heater, all that uh, calcium and magnesium, the yellow deposits, that's what, what you see mostly uh, where it comes out. You know, a lot of iron, obviously, in this one too, but coming from deeper. But, but most of the tunnel water is pretty pure. It's usually 58 degrees, and that's why it's good for fish. But it does have a lot of calcium in it and, um, and magnesium, and that's just native to the lava rock. A lot of times when you come to the end of the tunnel, uh, that's the reason it was the end. They hit a, a mother load of water at some point and the ground above just went <laughs> like that and, and three days later the farmer could be farming it. So, so the contractors a lot of times didn't want the canal company to know that they'd hit, that they drained all the ground above because they wanted to keep blasting farther. So the canal company had to make it very clear that we'll decide how far you're going to go. And, and one of those um, actually went to the Supreme Court. Uh, I think it was the Thorpe Tunnel under the golf course. The, the contractor wanted to keep going and the canal company pulled him out and put the, and said, no, we've gone far enough. Then 
the next year they put their own crew in and, and blasted the tunnel a bunch farther and, and so Mr. Molino sued them and it went all the way to the to this Idaho Supreme Court and, and the canal company won. But So then Molino went back to work and did several more tunnels for them. <laughs> this is that under the golf course again, the 17th fairway right up there. You can't go in it anymore. That one was was captured to go to the Daydream Ranch, which is down in uh, Rock Creek. But a lot of kids went into this tunnel because it was real accessible from the uh, below the golf course there. Uh, this is the Tolbert Tunnel. Uh, and this fish hatchery was a guy named Delbert Clunt that had it for a long time. I think, um, I think uh, Riverance or whoever owns Clear Springs Foods now, I think owns it. And I'm not even sure they're using this one anymore, but it was a real productive tunnel. And, and that's um, Rock Creek. So also Jim, rec Jim mentioned how valuable all the habitat that was provided by all the tunnels. And so this is Rock Creek at the county park in, in late September. I took this one a few years ago. And there's probably 75 CFS of water there. And this is Rock Creek coming out of the South Hills that same day. The snow's all gone and the farmers up in Crockett Meadows are diverting all the water. So, so all the water in Rock Creek that you see in late summer and through the winter is almost all from the local aquifer that we've created. So, you know, then in the spring, you got a lot of snow melt and, and through the summer, you've got irrigation water coming over the surface too. But, but the perennial water in Rock Creek, Deep Creek, Dry Creek, uh, Mud Creek, KTFI Creek, uh, S. Cooley, all of those, all those perennial streams that everybody duck hunts and, and um, you know, has all the habitat are all created by the, by the 51 tunnels that provide the water to them. So is there light at the end of the tunnel? And um, we've, we've, got, we've got a dog like this, and, and my daughters have tried this, and it didn't work. But, but they put the flashlight in one ear, and it comes right out the other side. So. And um, so anyway, yeah, the tunnels all still work today. They are. At some point, we're going to have to start recharging our south side aquifer because our irrigation practices have changed. We're, um, we're lining a lot of ditches, we're piping a lot of ditches, they're, we're converting to pivots and wheel lines, which when you furrow irrigate it, about 40% of the water goes down into the aquifer. When you sprinkle, probably 10 or 15%. And um, so, so that's making a big change. And then we've drilled thousands of domestic wells out into this aquifer too, and that's all. You drill a domestic well, you don't use much for the house, but you usually use a lot to water your grass. And when you water grass, almost none of it goes down to the aquifer. So, so, so the tunnels are going to start drying up. Durkee's Lake is going to start drying up. And, um, you know, I don't know how fast, but um, Chuck Brockway's done some predictions that by, uh, by the time we get to 80% sprinklers, we'll have taken, uh, I think we would drop 25 feet on our aquifer level tract wide. And that would be down to about the level of the tunnels. And that would be, you know, in the summertime. So. So they won't keep running if we don't, um, you know, if we keep drilling more domestic wells and if we don't start recharging somewhere. So I don't think we're going to talk the politicians into not letting people build in the Magic Valley. So, so we're going to have to start doing some recharge. When we've got extra water, we need to get it down into the aquifer because it's so valuable for, for all of our drinking water and for the, uh, you know, the cold, clear water that's coming back into the, all the streams and to the Snake River in the, in the summertime. Same problem everywhere. The whole West, I mean, aquifers are, are being over allocated and, and I better shut up and see if anybody, how long did I go? Way too long. Anyway, uh, if there's any questions or I can talk forever about this. The, the book will definitely be on the bestseller list within a few weeks here.